you know, now that we're entering ATV season, I want to kind of go over with you um, ATV injuries. Uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, the pattern of injuries that we see, um, the, um, the history of ATVs, um, and sp specifically in, in regulation of healthcare and injuries, and then go over some of our data to show how this may actually um, uh, reflect uh, our patient population, and then perhaps chance for um, uh, trauma prevention and improvement. So ATVs, or all-terrain vehicles, have been increasing in popularity over the last several years. The um, Consumer Product Safety Commission, these are the folks that regulate the amount of lead in your lunchbox, the, 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 the people that regulate the fact that your juicer won't slice your hand off. These are the people that also um, look at ATV injuries. And they estimated that ATV numbers have more than doubled from 1998 to 2004. And I'll show you some data that, that kind of shows that. These are kind of the modern ATV looks. Um, and, and what you're seeing kind of in the, in the top left over there is the, the, the real fast ATV. This is what most of our folks are riding in the desert, okay? They're, they're made by Suzuki, Honda, Yamaha, Polaris. Um, the one below is called the sand rail. It's kind of like a modified dune buggy, and you'll see a lot of these floating out in the desert as well. And the one on the right is more of the farm duty hunting type variety. It's a heavier ATV vehicle, has a little bit more horsepower, more torque. Um, we don't see these as much out here. They're mostly out in the deep south and uh, uh, back east, where I trained in, in western Pennsylvania. This is, you know, kind of par for the course out there. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty common. So ATV sales have amassed nearly $3 billion in 2006. And California, because of its sheer mass and the number of people, uh, leads the country in ATVs. And we have over 82,000 sales of ATVs in the end of 2005 with you know, over 813 total sales in the US, which is up significantly from um, uh, 211,000 at the turn of the, uh, uh, um, the year 2000. And if you see here, these are looking at injuries per se. California leads all states in injuries. And this is again because we're just so massive, right? We have so many people. Is that frequency uh, per year? Or? I'm sorry, no, I don't know. I can't remember exactly. But if you look at cumulative frequency overall, that leads, if you look at cumulative frequency on the left, that's actually an injury. And then cumulative frequency is when take it per capita, which of course is going to be lower because their population is so large. Consumer, report, consumer complaint reports, or do they do something else? This is the Consumer Product Safety Commission, right? So this is looking at all injuries uh, uh, admitted through the emergency room in the hospitals. They have a searchable database, but I think it's mostly based on complaints, not on any. Perspective. Yeah, no, this is actual injuries. And if this is the Motorcycle Industry Council, in 2009, this was just released actually, it just came out uh, just a few weeks ago. And you can see that total ATV sales, OHM stands for um, off-highway motorcycles. So we see a lot of these folks as well in our trauma bay. They're, they're also playing out in the desert as well with ATVs. And you can see that we really saw this real uptick after 1998. And I'll show you why that might be the reason why. And really just kind of continue to go up. And I think it was kind of the downturn of the economy at the end of 2006 and 2007 that really caused these sales to fall off. We don't have quite um, data yet for 2008 uh, and uh, 2009, but it'll be interesting. I'm, I'm sure they're going to be less. OHM is off highway motorcycle? Yeah. So this is, of course, California. The red is Imperial Valley, or Imperial County, I should say. And if you look at it a little bit more carefully, this is where Glamis is, and this is where most of our ATVers are enjoying themselves in, uh, in the Imperial County. El Centro's kind of over here somewhere. You can kind of see some of the farmlands of El Centro right here, but El Centro Regional Hospital is right here. Brawley is kind of over here, and this is Glamis. And it's actually a, a pretty beautiful part of the country. Um, uh, I've flown over it several times. Uh, uh, Jay's flown over it actually uh, at lower altitude, and it's this beautiful kind of Sahara type of sand, very, very fine sand. Um, uh, no, they shot that in Tunis. And well, then you can see why, because here you can see this kind of uh, nice dune type of a, uh, uh, a layer. Very pretty, and I, and I would imagine that I would like to camp there. Well, these folks do their own uh, way of camping, and this is a gentleman who is uh, flying off of uh, one of the dunes in Glamis. And what you're seeing here is a, is a good example of how these injuries occur. And it, 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 it's interesting when you note that 
there is some helmet use in this, and I want you to pay attention. This is actually, I picked this up off of um, GlamisGoDunes.com, and there's a bunch of blogs there. This was actually Thanksgiving of 2008, and I have some recent pictures here. Um, and you can see that there is no protective equipment that this gentleman's wearing, save for the helmet, and same for this, this child, he, he, uh, I'm presuming, uh, based on his body habitus. And we'll show you some data why that might be important. Uh, this is Oldsmobile Hill in Glamis. Um, this hill right here is uh, kind of a, a, a rite of passage for these folks to zoom up this hill in their, in their ATVs. And this is basically a, an, an extended city. And, and I'll show you some data that basically this area population um, basically um, increases by five times during the, the ATV season, specifically for this reason right here. And uh, a nighttime shot, uh, it doesn't, the, the, the sun doesn't set uh, uh, for their thrills. And, and it really is um, an experience in many ways. And now, I, I suspect that one day we will get a code orange. There will be some major tragedy, some large explosion. And all these folks out here, um, not all these folks, but a good portion of these folks out here will be injured. This will come. I guarantee it. Um, I, I, I just hope I'm long retired at that point because this will be a, a real true uh, challenge in, in several hours of, of waking up caring for these folks. And this is uh, uh, beyond the Oldsmobile Hill. This is called the drag. And traditionally what they do on the Friday after Thanksgiving, and this is, by the way, all on the blog sites. Um, you can look it up. Uh, they, they have one side here. There's this drag, as you can see right here. And then there's another side of, of people. And, and they're basically doing all sorts of tricks on the ATVs going through the drag. Um, and uh, it, it's fascinating. There is a cultural element to this. Um, uh, and it's something that I think, you know, and I'll show you some data on that too that I think is important as we relate um, to this to our patient population. Uh, of course, accidents are plenty. Um, this is a truck uh, that has rolled over, um, obviously the ATV. So it's kind of like the Civil War out there. I mean, here's the Confederate flag right here. Here's the Union flag over here. It's really quite interesting. I mean, there is this, this element to that. And, and, of course, as I mentioned, there's a cultural element to this, and it's ingrained in, in the culture of, of many folks that live in this area. Um, if the A-arms ain't bending, you're just pretending. Shut up and ride. And uh, the A-arms of the, the arms of the ATV uh, got glam of sand. And, and this is a little worrisome, um, not so much um, for the philosophy, the family that plays together stays together. It's the fact that in, in, in uh, many families, this is, in fact, a, a family event, which I think plays a role in preventive um, trauma care, especially with the pediatric population. And I'll show you some um, uh, interesting and unfortunate data on that, on that regard. Uh, to go a little bit more on the epidemiology of folks that ride ATVs and off uh, highway motorcycles, this is again from the Motor Motorcycle Industry Council. It really spans all socioeconomic groups. Um, we do have um, people that are quote unquote professionals at the managerial level. Uh, if you look at those that are riding ATVs and um, off highway motorcycles, uh, blue collar folks, mechanics, um, retired, um, and, and look at students, um, you know, almost 18% uh, of the ATV population and, and a fairly large percentage of the OHM population as well, given the fact that these are um, uh, students. So it really spans uh, all demographic groups, including educational groups. I mean, here we have college graduates uh, in 2008, 23%, some college 35%, um, you know, high school or less, uh, a little bit more. But that basically reflects the majority trauma population, the hospital population at large. So this really is not specific to a specific type of social strategy. And by the way, in our numbers, the majority of these patients are actually insured. Um, you know, so uh, these folks have the resources to buy ATVs and to, to, to spend the time in the desert. So um, ATVs were first introduced by Honda in 1971. And it was originally used as an aid for industry, farming, and government use. Um, as riders for recreation began to increase, ATV trauma was significantly rising, especially in the three-wheel models. Now, uh, let me, let me um, give full, full dis disclosure. When I was uh, uh, nine years old, a, a friend of mine had a, a three-wheeler ATV in, in, in the backwaters of Michigan, and I would visit him occasionally. And, and, and this would have been me, sans the helmet. And, and they really are a lot of fun. I mean, I can understand this. Um, this specific three-wheeler is quite dangerous. Uh, it has an inherent side winner of a high center of gravity. It was prone to rollovers. And the risk of injury is almost 5%. And this was well documented in the, in the early 90s and late 80s. Specifically to such an extent that actually in the mid to late 80s, this specific ATV had a lot of attention from consumer groups, pediatricians, and um, injury advocates. And it led to uh, what was called the 1988 um, 
uh, this is through the Computer Product Safety Commission, it was called the 10-year consent degree. And it was actually enforced by the Department of Justice. And these are the main elements of the consent degree that was instituted in 1988. Ceasing the production of all three wheelers, which by the way, you, you just don't see them anymore. Ban selling quote unquote large ATVs to children less than 16 years old. And that's defined as a specific weight, and I'll go over some of that. Safety training for all buyers. Safety warnings clearly visible on all ATVs. Policing dealers for compliance. And a very aggressive public awareness um, campaign. And perhaps some of you that can recall that, that period of time do remember this. I, mean, I, I do remember that because the ATV was taken away from us as children. We were upset. Um, and, uh, and I remember the, 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 the hoopla surrounding it. Now, to what extent did they actually have on decreasing injury? Let's just, uh, before we do that, let's look at this. Remember, this is a 10-year consent decree. So in 1998, it expired. So now what? So at this point, the ATV consent decree expired. The manufacturers then entered what was called the Voluntary ATV Action Plan. And this was voluntary. There was no teeth to this, to this law. It was similar to the t consent decree in terms of its wordings, but it was not enforceable by the Justice Department, not enforceable by the CPSC, and the policy compliance was enforced by select members from the ATV industry itself. So you can imagine that there was probably very little in terms of actual true enforcement of this actual consent decree. When you look at the estimated injuries, and we look at 85, 86, 87, 88, this is when the consent decree went into effect, notice the amount of injuries dropped, and dropped significantly, and stayed low after the uh, consent decree went into effect in 1988. And the deaths also had a similar drop. If you look at kind of the last uh, 15 years of data by Homecamp out of West Virginia, who does a lot of work in, in ATV injuries in, in the pediatric population. Again, you can see that in 1988, right when the consent decree came into effect, and again, this is where a lot of the public advocacy groups came in, ATV injuries really subsided quite, quite impressively. And then in 1998, when the cons consent decree actually was um, expired, all of a sudden you started to see this blip and rise in ATV accidents and injuries. Now, in terms of ATV regulations, what changed? For one, ATV size increased dramatically. We're talking about from 200 to 250 centimeter, um, cubic centimeters of engine size. Top speeds are well over 70 miles, 75 miles an hour. And the model weights have also increased as well, now to over 600 pounds in, in many of these models. Some of the, the faster ones are lighter. Some of the heavier ones are obviously um, uh, more sturdy. And marketing has increased as well. We went from $5.8 million in 1996 to $37.3 million in 2001. And ATV numbers have increased from four to over seven million nationwide. This is marketing in terms of ATV dollars. And again, remember the consent decree expired in 1998. Look at that, 1998, bam. This huge explosion in, in ATV marketing. So a really significant increase in, 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 in the advertising campaign of the ATV itself. This is a, a, a clip from one of those ads. Um, probably not recommended for a 15-year-old to do. Probably not recommended for a 25-year-old to do, for that matter. And if you look at, of course, off-road injuries, you've seen the same thing, that you see this kind of gentle increase from 1998, and then around 2000 or so, you see this real um, heavy increase. Um, the top line is adults. The bottom line is pediatrics. And again, if you look at the, um, the Scutchville paper, same scenario. That uh, in 1985, really through 1998, if you look at um, risk estimate per 10,000 vehicles, you see a, a fairly modest, uh, a fairly large number here in the 300s or so. And then this drop off after the consent decree. Really continuing, the consent decree expires, an increase again. If you look at the Keller folks, and this is the group out of uh, uh, Pennsylvania, the same scenario, that you have this fairly kind of baseline level of ATV injuries, Consent decree expires, and then all of a sudden you see this increase. Now, there could be several factors in this as well, but when the data is over and all saying this from different institutions, one has to think about this. This is our data, and we looked at this as well, and we looked at uh, ATV history, a 21-year history of ATVs, and we again saw this kind of increase, very similar in scope to the Keller paper, we saw the same thing. Now our rise happened a little bit later. We noticed a rise really happening in 2001 and then really uh, really um, exploding at uh, 2005. But we also saw this consistent rise in ATV injury as well. 
And there is a seasonal distribution for us which is really quite different from a lot of other centers. And our ATVs, the season really starts in, in October uh, with Thanksgiving being the kind of kickoff holiday of ATV injuries. And that continues to increase, really peaking at President's Day weekend in February, which um, I, I think I requested actually to be off, which would hopefully be nice. And, uh, and then, then which, doesn't, which, which doesn't surprise me. Um, and, uh, and again, um, starting to ebb as the desert begins to get hot. So we do see this kind of seasonal pattern of ATV injuries, and we do this, this uh, increase in ATV injuries over the last few years, um, really the last 10 years if you think about it. And I haven't looked at the numbers for the last, uh, really, 2007, 2008, when I agreed to give this talk, uh, Professor Fortledge is unfortunately taken ill. Um, so uh, it would be interesting to see what our numbers are. My suspicion is they probably dropped off a little bit, consistent with ATV sales dropping off, but still quite high. We then decided to compare ATV injuries before the consent decree, that is to say 1985 to 1999, and then after the consent decree expired for 2000 and onwards. And we gave about a year or so of lag time. And we noticed that similar to what I was showing in the previous graph, that our mean number of patients per year increased significantly, almost four times. Everything else remained the same. Mean age, male gender, which obviously the majority of these are male, admission systolic blood pressure, GCS. Interesting enough, about 10% of these folks are alcohol positive. It's probably higher, but by the time they come to us and we actually get the talk screen, uh, it's likely that um, their alcohol has been metabolized. And again, mean ISS is a little bit sicker back in 1985 uh, statistically, but, but really not uh, uh, biologically that significant. If we look at injury patterns, again, almost identical, except for three things have changed. One is spinal cord injuries were much higher in the area of the quote unquote consent decree. And I'll show you why that might be the case. We did see closed head injury to be actually lower in uh, the modern era, quote unquote the modern era, after the expiration of the consent decree. And I'll show you why that might be the case. What we did see, however, was a significant increase in long bone fractures. Now, that might be several reasons why that would be the case. It might be a lack of wearing proper equipment. It might be heavier ATVs, faster ATVs. So we certainly have seen a little bit of a shift in long bone fractures. And I'm going to show you why we think that spinal cord and closed head injuries have actually decreased despite this consent decree expiring and why this might be a good evidence for areas of prevention. So again, uh, if you look at long bone fractures, that has increased statistically. Now, in 1988, California was one of the few states that instituted mandatory helmet laws for all ATV drivers. Now, there are actual California wildlife commissioners out in Glamis, and they're looking for ATV permits because you have to have a permit to drive it out there, and they're looking for helmet use. Okay? And California also mandates ATV training for all the drivers underneath the age of 14. Now, it is possible that it's because of those specific legal restrictions that really didn't get strictly enforced until about the mid-1990s. That might be one of the reasons we're seeing this decrease in close head injury. And it's also been shown by Sarkar et al. that patients that actually wear a helmet have a significant decrease of cervical injury as well, if you look at this um, line over here, including spinal cord injury. And we saw that statistically significant decrease in spinal cord injury. So it's very possible that helmet laws actually not only improve brain injury, but also may be responsible for the decrease in spinal cord injury that we saw. These are the states that currently have uh, mandatory helmet laws, period. Shockingly few stars. And I want you to concentrate on the deep south right here. And I want you to remember exactly where the stars are absent. And think about this map very carefully, because I'm going to show you a, an unfortunate uh, map again in, in the very near future. Unfortunately, this is again taken from uh, GlamisGoDunes.com. This was um, uh, President's Day weekend 2007. Uh, these folks are not wearing helmets. So even though there are laws in place, and even though there, are, um, there is enforcement, as California state budget problems increase, you can imagine inform enforcement may actually decrease. And it's very possible that we may be seeing more significant closed head injuries uh, and uh, preventable um, ATV injuries secondary to the lack of restriction. Uh, he looks fairly young. He acts fairly young. <laughs> so 
again, if we look at really um, the demographics and, and uh, uh, what we saw in our patient population, we really didn't see a whole lot of change from a lot of big factors. We did see a drop in mean length of stay, which isn't surprising given the fact that we're a little bit more aggressive about rehabilitation, getting patients up and out, ambulatory, home health care has increased um, as well, and that's probably decreased our mean length of stay. But really, when you look at patients that have been discharged to home, transferred to another hospital, transferred to rehab, death, um, luckily very few, uh, we really haven't uh, seen a whole shift. So the population is basically, I would argue, very similar, but elements of ATVs have changed, elements of laws have changed, and that may have affected certain injury patterns that we've seen. Um, in, uh, the Scutchfield group uh, analyzed that uh, they feel the annual cost of ATV injuries in the nation is approximately $6.5 billion. In 2006 alone, our hospital charges for ATV patients was $4.5 million. So a significant amount of money is actually being charged to these patients that are injured in ATVs. When you think about um, healthcare costs, and you think about risky behavior that adds to this, it's something that, that may play in the equation in the future. So in 2008, California ATV sales were about 10% lower. Again, that, that is um, uh, likely reflective of the economy. Uh, so what are consumers doing? They're shifting to kid quads. They're cheaper, they're smaller, and they're faster ATVs. Um, and and the, the, the specific ATV news dealership specifically mentioned that and wants to market exactly these, these, these kid quad type of vehicles. And this is kind of what they look like. This is adult quad, bad idea, bad idea, bad idea. This is kid quad, bad idea, no helmet, bad idea, no helmet, bad idea. Preventable, folks, and this is not, um, uh, it's cute that little Jody and John are on the ATV. This is not cute. And I don't think I need to say a whole lot more about this slide. If you remember that slide that I showed you before about the map, look at all these children ATV deaths in the Deep South. These are preventable injuries. These are things that, that certainly can actually uh, um, uh, be prevented with better education, better regulation, um, and, uh, uh, and tighter enforcement. Unfortunately, children are still dying. And um, those of us involved in trauma that have taken care of uh, children dying in front of rise really don't want to see these things replicated. But there's hope. If you look at cigarettes, um, this is from the 1940s, um, physicians say luckies are less irritating because it's toasted. And uh, this gentleman says, smoke a fresh cigarette. And this is a steward lighting a cigarette uh, of a patient, or excuse me, of a, well, will be a patient probably in the future, of a, of a, of a lady flying in a, in a commercial aircraft. So attitudes have certainly shifted in terms of healthcare and in terms of um, uh, healthcare prevention. Uh, I'm hoping that ATV injury um, healthcare prevention will also shift. I wrote a, 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 um, a letter to the editor in, in uh, March of 2009 to the San Diego Union Tribune. Um, there was a, uh, an editorial by Michael Stats saying that you know, restricting ATVs doesn't make any sense. It's, it's a family affair. And, and, and I wrote an editorial saying, well, that's, that's not true. It's, it's, it's a really dangerous affair. And, and uh, it's something that really should be regulated. So I think there's hope. Um, uh, the desert's a beautiful place. Um, I think ATVs are, are here to stay. But I think if we're able to, to, to have tighter regulation, as we have with the consent decree, and we've shown that that works, injuries decrease, then I'm hoping that we can actually um, decrease ATV injuries and, and hopefully prevent um, uh, these horrific accidents that, uh, that we all see. And, and we'll see a couple, unfortunately, come through our trauma bay that um, we'll shake our heads and, and know that this is clearly preventable. Thank you very much. Thank you. I found it amazing that they write at night like that, how they can actually see the differentiation in the sand dunes. Did you look at the time of day of incident at all? No, that, that's actually interesting. No, we, we did not look at that. So, um, we had a few come at nighttime yeah. from nighttime accidents, but most of them are still daytime. And are ATVs and quads the same thing? Yeah. Yes. And, 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 and the picture that I showed you before showing the different types of ATVs, I mean, they're, they're, they're really kind of melding. I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing, you know, fancy souped-up golf carts that are called rhinos. I didn't put a picture of that in there. That are being taken from the dunes and the deserts. Um, these sand rails are modified dune buggies that are a little bit smaller than the traditional dune buggies. And, of course, the traditional ATV itself. Um, and so uh, uh, we're seeing 
you know, all sorts of, of, of injuries from those, from those types of ve recreational vehicles, and sometimes it's exactly not sure what the heck they are. Um, transfer physicians don't really know. Sometimes the patients themselves don't really know. Let's say it's an ATV, then they talk to the family and say, oh, it was like a, it was a rhino, I had a roof on it. Nevertheless, the injury patterns are, are pretty similar. There's a class action lawsuit against some of these different models. Typically, the Rhino is actually a, there's some attorneys advertising for yeah, recently. candidates for that, trying to sue the uh, Yamaha company. But those are, the sand rails are generally custom built. They're hand, and uh, I sent around a video a few months ago of a, of a I think it was maybe an eight year old. Yeah, I saw that. In a 200 horsepower sand rail, which was really crazy. Yeah, I mean, I, you know. In some ways, those patients should almost be arrested for child abuse, or at least neglect. And that's really the sand reel has the advantage in that if the patient, if the person inside is restrained, if they have an accident, there is some protection. But we've had some sand reel accidents where people who weren't restrained or came out of restraints, and of course, a small child with well, the belts won't fit. Or we've had them with crushed uh, arms and hands because their hands went outside the cage and they rolled over on their hands. So we've seen that too. So. In your own um, personal experience, do you see a difference in your types of injuries due to ATV accidents versus like highway motorcycle accidents? Yeah, I think um, uh, yes. The answer is yes. Uh, the real difference, I think, is is um, speed and impact. You know, one of the, the the blessings of at least being out in the desert is that for the most part, it's sand. So there's a little bit of blunting of the actual force when you when you hit the ground. Um, it, whereas in motorcycles, it's generally freeway speed, and you're either hitting against another car or you're hitting concrete. And so the ISS of those injuries in terms of motorcycle highway injuries are generally a great deal higher than we see with these injuries. Our ISS is only 15, 14, a, a mean ISS, which is um, you know moderate trauma, um, as opposed to uh, some of the freeway motorcycle accidents where ISS is greater than 20, which is generally severe trauma. That's a, something really bad, though. Some of the fatalities are involved ATV versus ATV or motorcycle versus car and off-road vehicle. And so they get collisions out there quite nasty sometimes. Are most of them collisions or are they like just personal, you're flipping your vehicle? Yeah, the vast majority of them are falls off the actual ATV. Um, so that, that uh, person that I showed you jumping off the dune, that's our patient. Um, and, and that's the majority that we see. Roll over ATVs falling off the ATV. And we are seeing a fair amount of collisions here and there as well, but the vast majority of them are falling off the ATV. Yeah, there are all sorts of injuries. That, you know, that picture that you show the guy jumping over the dune, then there's another guy doing the same thing on the other side and they crash right in the middle, or they roll, or when they land, they break their spine. And you see all sorts of stupidity. I, I, I you know, for you guys starting on the trauma service today, we don't treat something that happens randomly. This is a disease, okay? Trauma is a disease like any other disease you treat. Unfortunately, this is a disease that's linked to the gene of stupidity <laughs> because it's 100% preventable. Um, and that's why it's a disease because you, we know what it is, we know what the causes are, we know how to prevent it. So we know more about this than we know about cardiovascular disease or cancer. The problem is that you see the degree of stupidity varies. Invariably, 50% of these people are intoxicated. They are under the influence of alcohol or drugs. The other day, this is was what about three weeks ago, we had a guy on the trauma service, 82-year-old guy ATV crash. I mean, what are you doing riding your ATV when you're 82? You know, I'm all for liberty, and you, you know, you should have your your life if you're in good shape. You should. You should be out there doing whatever you want. But the reality is, you don't need to expose yourself to that degree of danger. Um, I, I, I tell people, you know, go to the beach and read a book. You know, it's as fun as riding your ATV, maybe, or maybe not. But the reality in our trauma clinic is that if you try to do some prevention or talk about prevention with these people, if they are not severely injured, which means if they are not paralyzed for life, they go back. I talked to a lot of people that had spinal uh, 
fractures, particularly lumbar spinal fractures, nobody gets paralyzed because of lumbar spinal fractures. And they have those horrible compression fractures. They get a big operation. They have, you know, metal in their spine. They come back to clinic. If they're walking, and you walk in and say, no more ATVs, right? And they say, come on, doc. This is the funnest thing I do in my life. You know, this is how I bond with my family. This, this is what we do together every weekend from October <laughs> to April. We travel out there and we have fun. I'm going back. There is no question about it. And, and some people say, well, I could be dead just by crossing the street and being hit by a car here. That's the comparison they make. So, you know, there is very little you can do because the pressure of the injury is huge. And uh, you just can't fight with them. So you need to work with them. I think that the best prevention to this is work with them, not against them. When we tried to do something several years ago when Vishal was interested in, in this, and uh, we, 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 we found out that uh, some of the uh, politicians in South Bay, they didn't want to talk to us about it because they are ATV riders. And, so, and they support, they support the, the sport and they support the industry in San Diego behind it. So it's, it's tough. It's a tough issue. Yeah, but you see the extreme of ages as well. It's not just a... Uh, a thing of the young, healthy, that's being stupid and drinking and driving their ATV in El Centro. You see a lot of seven, eight, nine-year-old kids riding their ATVs. In the middle of a lot of adults, they're completely drunk. You know, that's the danger. And you see the 82-year-old guy crashing his ATV too. Some of these people, they go out so far and, and they roll and they are by themselves and it takes 10, 12, 16 hours for them to be found. And they come in with rhabdo, and they come in hypothermic, and you know, it's renal failure. So there are other consequences. That, um, that area out there, people realize how large it is. It's really, really large. It's huge. It's, you know, it's like Long Island size. It's, you know, it's, it, it's fun to drive out there on one weekend if you guys have time, because first of all, this is a beautiful drive. It's two hours from here. You take eight and go straight, and you will see when you pass Ocotillo, you will start seeing the dunes. And it's a beautiful drive, driving over the mountains. The scenery is awesome. But when you get there, and you see what these people do, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. My next door neighbors, they, have, they had four ATVs, mom, dad, and two kids. The youngest kid was seven, and he had his own ATV until the day that the ATV of his uh, the daughter, who was 10, she rolled, the ATV flipped over her, and they knocked at my door on a Sunday night, and she was completely bruised up, and I said, what are you doing here? You should be at children's hospital. And, and it's incredible. And then they decided to sell the ATV. Families have three, four, five ATVs, and if you drive on Friday afternoon on 8, when you leave your CSD and you take 8 East, you're going to see a lot of pickup trucks carrying their ATVs in the back, 3, 4 ATVs. It's actually a pain to drive over there because there's this long line of trucks with ATVs. I can give you an aerial survey any weekend you want. You can see the madness from... Uh, no. Jay can take us uh, on a ride on this call. Yeah. Yeah, it's like you're watching a bunch of lunatic ants going in circles. Yeah. <laughs> what in particular do you, because you were saying like working with your patients instead of going against them, what in particular were you thinking about when you're talking to Imperial County and suggesting on how to prevent? No, I think we need to work not with the patients, but we need to work with the ATV clubs and we need to work with the industry. Um, and, and just bring to their attention the issue of injury prevention, etc., in a in a way that's not confrontational. If if you go out there and say, you know, we gotta create laws that will prevent the industry from selling ATV to minors, it's not gonna go anywhere. But if you work with them and you try to emphasize the importance of injury prevention and uh, protective equipment and not riding after you drink 
and other things, then you may go somewhere. You're not going to eradicate the problem, but you may you may decrease the incidence of severe injury. Is it considered a DUI if you crash one of these things intoxicated? Like you, uh, you yes, but it's impossible to enforce. I, I don't know because when you are off road, there are no rules. Well, right? they, they, they are enforced by the California Gaming Commission. I mean, they're, they're, you have to have permits to drive on it, and it is. But you can't enforce it. You, you don't have to have a driver's license to operate these things. So right. um, the and worst they, they can do well, is I mean, take like away. A, you get a DUI if you ride a bicycle. Yeah, you're they, they take away your sticker basically. There's not a whole lot they can do, and you know, unlike you know, CHP that can you know measure blood when you're here in the trauma bay, they don't have the resources to have a nurse to measure blood, so you can't enforce their. Yeah. You know, the the small hospitals in Imperial County they get slammed every weekend with like. And, and this is so bad that they have at all times an ambulance in the entrance of the recreational area because they are constantly busy taking people to the hospital. Sometimes a helicopter too. Yeah. Sometimes the guys will sit up there. They, they told me that they set up tents outside their ER because they get so many people, they don't have to come to the ER, they just come to the tent. And they, it's like a line, they just come and come through. And the serious ones get sent here. The non for every one that we get, they get like another 20 that they oh, yeah. to sign up. They see gas yeah, I mean, I mean, just look ankle fractures stri- and muffler burns. And all kinds let, let's just look at because I think this is the best picture I think that we have here, just kind of typify the the scenario. This is really what you're seeing here, and this is basically. What I mean, how can you enforce? Anything? It's a hundred thousand people out there sometimes. <laughs> I mean, all of. Yeah, I mean, look at that. This one, I like. You see the young kid there watching. All of a sudden, this ATV loses control and slashes on, slams on five people there. Well, here, here's the thing that you, it's also very. I mean, there is like a, there's like a, it's it's kind of like a gang element to it. I mean, it, you know, it's it's really kind of interesting. <laughs> it's really. I know. I like know. the flags. Oh yeah, let's uh, let's look at that. So this is. Well, yeah, and a lot this of is, uh, Bavarian crosses. You know, there, there, there's the Confederacy. There's the German cross. That's a. That's the, basically yeah. a, a, a permutation of that. And if you see no, the guy, no, not, not, it has nothing to do with the. Have life. you seen the ads? <laughs> the have you US. seen the ads for the guys who sell these things in town? There's yeah. one guy. He says, you know, the reason to ride is because you're a rebel. You can ride a motorcycle and stick it to the man. He basically says that everyone's yeah. So they're not really interested in a lot of authority, yeah. regulation, or control. And then th- this to me is just incredible. I mean, look at this thing. It's, how can you enforce that? It's just impossible. You know, every year the helmet law is challenged in California by the industry that sells ATVs and motor, particularly motorcycles. And the guy that goes to, to Sacramento every year to challenge the law is has a tattoo in his forehead that says uh, freedom. And he says, you know, you are interfering with my freedom if you make me wear a helmet. And he goes before the legislature in Sacramento every year. So trauma surgeons go there and testify against or on, on in support of the helmet law, etc. And we haven't been uh, very uh, lucky in California that, that they haven't dropped the law. But in other states that uh, they uh, abolished the uh, helmet law, uh, the incidence of severe close head injury and uh, head, head injury related death increased dramatically. Montana is a classic example. No. Do you have anything else? No? All right. Good conference. Thank you. Good talk. Thank you.